The next talk in the clinical examination series is regarding signs in heart disease. We have discussed symptoms and now we are looking at how to examine the child with heart disease. When we see the child, we first try to make out whether the child is comfortable or in distress because if the child is too much in distress, uh, you need to look after the child first. Otherwise, you can do an anthropometry. You will get height, weight, head circumference. You can see whether there is cyanosis or clubbing. You can do a head to toe examination for congenital abnormalities like abnormal facies, limb anomalies, polydactyly, syndactyly, etc., which have a certain clinical connotation and as a pointer to the type of heart disease the child may be harboring. And the child in distress is likely to be tachypneic, bobbing the head with intercostal and subcostal retractions, poor pulses, and tachycardia. Tachypnea, it of course, has. This is a very seriously ill child. You don't have time to examine this child in detail. This child needs to be in an ICU, is likely to require ventilation, and um, uh, you need to be very, very swift in responding to such a child. But if the baby is quiet, you are examining the child in detail. And what we are discussing today presumes that you have the time and the baby is allowing you to have a detailed examination. Like in any pediatric uh, examination, you will do height, weight, head circumference. In general examination, you will not look for cyanosis or clubbing. You will do head to toe examination. Failure to thrive, we discussed. So when the height and weight are below expectations, you say that the child has failure to thrive. We have already discussed the mechanisms for failure to thrive uh, in the previous class. Typical facies of D. George syndrome, Williams syndrome, Noonan, Down, each has some specific features and um, the presence of the syndrome alerts you that you should be looking for characteristic heart disease associated with the syndrome. For instance, in Down, a complete AV canal defect. In Noonan syndrome, a dysplastic pulmonary valve with pulmonary stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It is the recognition of the dysmorphism as indicative of the particular syndrome, which alerts you that you should be looking for specific cardiac features of their syndrome. These factors apart, once you have reached the cardiovascular examination stage from the general examination, you start the exam in the sequence of pulse, blood pressure, JVP, and then the test wall. The pulse is a pressure distension wave due to ejection of blood into an already filled iota, propagated along the arterial walls and palpable in all superficial peripheral arteries. There are three components to that definition, two long ones. What is it? It's a pressure distension wave. How is it generated? Because the LV is pumping into an already filled iota. How is it propagated? Along the arterial walls. And where do you feel them? In the superficial peripheral arteries. The pulse wave has two systolic components, the percussion wave and the tidal wave, and a diastolic component, the dichrotic wave. The percussion wave is the impulse generated by LV ejection. The tidal wave are the tidal waves are reflected waves from the upper part of the body. The dichrotic wave occurs by the recoil of blood from the closed diotic valve and reflectance waves from the lower part of the body superimposed on that. In the normal pulse trace, you see only the percussion wave and the dichrotic wave. You don't see the reflectance waves, so the tidal wave is not recognized. When you describe the pulse, it is described as n beats per minute, 70 beats per minute, say. And um, at this point, you recognize whether it is normal tachycardia or bradycardia, more than 100, you call it tachycardia, more than less than 60, you call bradycardia. Then is it regular or irregular? Volume of the pulse? 
the character of the pulse, radiofemoral delay, and the peripheral pulses. The normal pulse will be described as the pulse is, say, 80 per minute, regular, normal in volume, normal in character. There is no radiofemoral delay, and all peripheral pulses are felt normally. We will look at abnormalities at each stage of this. The rhythm may be irregular because there is a uh, premature ventricular or atrial contraction resulting in a bigemini or a trigemini or a totally irregular pulse. Free, too frequent ectopics or atrial fibrillation is the cause for totally irregular pulse. The volume of the pulse is the amplitude of the expansive movement of the vessel wall. It can be normal, low, or high. And the objective measure of the pulse uh, volume is the pulse pressure. A low volume pulse is a feature of a low output state, as in severe aortic stenosis or severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. And a high volume pulse occurs in aortic regurgitation, PDA, AV fistula, fever, pregnancy, and many other conditions. Two specific abnormalities of the pulse are worth discussing. Pulses alternance and pulses paradoxes. In pulses alternance, the alternating pulse beats have a lower volume. It denotes a severe left ventricular failure. In the lower volume pulse, complete myocardium is not involved in contraction. It's often triggered by a partial, uh, a triggered by an ectopic beat. Pulses paradoxes is an exaggerated inspiratory decline of the pulse. It is elicited by sphygmomanometry. As you are lowering the pressure after inflating the cuff, the Kuretko sounds are heard initially only on expiration. Later, you would hear it in both the phases as the uh, deflation proceeds. This is a feature of cardiac tamponer or constrictive pericarditis. It can also occur in status asthmaticus. The character of the pulse, the different attributes together give a defined character to the pulse, like a collapsing pulse in aortic regurgitation, where there's a high volume pulse with a rapid upstroke, ill-sustained peak, and a rapid downstroke. It is appreciated with the distal part of the palm and elevating the arm. Aortic regurgitation or a PDA is the typical ex uh, reason for a collapsing pulse. There are a number of other causes. A bisphariens pulse is a double beating pulse where both the percussion wave and the tidal wave are palpable. And the causes, chronic severe aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis with aortic regurgitation, or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Look at these cartoons. The normal pulse this is a little more rounded than what you would normally see in a trace. So there is a percussion wave and there is a dichrotic wave. In pulses alternance, note that this is of a higher volume. This is of a lower volume. This is pulses alternance. Pulses bisphariens, there are two peaks in systole. So you have the percussion wave and the tidal wave is actually seen. And then you have the dichrotic wave. Pulses paradoxes, some of the pulse uh, beats are lower in volume. And you can see that the ones that are lower in volume are in inspiration. We have uh, terms like uh, dichrotic pulse, pulses power set tardis, anacrotic pulse, etc. When you move to peripheral pulses, remember, whenever you are palpating the radial pulse, have your other hand on the pedal pulses. Get into the habit of feeling the radial pulse along with the pedal pulses. And when you feel the radial pulse, also feel the opposite side pulse. And in a given situation, look for all the pulses. Palpate both radials and pedals. Asymmetry of the upper limb pulses, may the one radial pulse being stronger or weaker than the other one, may be a feature of certain diseases. If you have a coarctation prior to the left subclavian, the two radial pulses will be of different volume. If there is a Takeyasu arthritis, the affected side pulse will be poorer. If the right subclavian is from the descending aorta, a common abnormality, 
the right radial pulse will be lower. There's the, the interesting entity called isolation of the left or right subclavian. This usually associated with tetralogy of fellow, where the subclavian arises as a continuation of the ductus. So a ductus is constricting and the subclavian and the corresponding radial pulse is of lower volume. In supravalvar aortic stenosis, the jet of uh, flow follows the aortic wall into the right subclavian. So that pulse will be of higher volume. This physical phenomenon is called the Coanda effect. And the right radial pulse is more than the left radial in supravalvar AS because of this. And we have um, illustrated some of the reasons for asymmetry of the upper limb pulses here. When you feel the pulse with the femorals, with the radial pulse with the femorals, if you find that the femorals are absent, feeble, or delayed, that's what you call a radiofemoral delay. It commonly denotes coarctation of iota, but in an elderly adult, it may be due to atherosclerosis. And even in children, iotoarthritis can cause patchy loss of pulses, including a radiofemoral delay. From pulse, you move to blood pressure. Recording BP in children is normally commonly done with a sphygmomanometry and a pediatric cuff. You need a range of cuffs to suit the varying sizes of the uh, upper limb in the child. You can have a flush method to uh, record the mean blood pressure in neonates when you are the decreasing the cuff pressure after inflating the cuff in a neonate, the pressure at which the arm flushes. It denotes the mean blood pressure. The normal non-invasive measurement that we do is called the oscillometric technique. And the oscillometric technique will uh, show a non-invasive reading, but remember it is amenable or vulnerable to the same errors when the small manometer cuff is inappropriate. Please remember how the correct course sounds are classified and uh, they can be classified from phase one to phase five. Phase one beginning with the first loud sound and uh, phase five being the disappearance of sounds. Hypertension, you must know, is defined as blood pressure more than the 95th centile. After pulse and blood pressure, you move to jugular venous pulse. The jugular venous pulse is measured in the right internal jugular vein in older children. In an infant, you don't bother to look at the uh, JVP because there's hardly any visible neck for the infant. And in, in an infant, palpating the liver will give you the same information as by looking at the JVP. The Normal waves in the JVP, if you look at this cartoon, the, uh, see each um, stage carefully. When the atrium is contracting, which means the heart is in the later part of diastole, <laughs> you get the A wave. Then as the tricuspid valve opens, you get the, the as the ventricle is contracting, sorry, as the ventricle is contracting, the tricuspid valve is descending and um, the later you get the V wave as the atrium is filling. As the tricuspid valve is opening, you get the Y wave and, and then Y descend and then the A wave. So the A wave denotes atrial contraction. The V wave denotes atrial filling. It, it's a systolic event. You recognize the A wave as pre systolic by palpating the corresponding carotid. You can put your hand on the opposite carotid and feel the uh, carotid at the time when you are looking at the JVP. If the, the wave is seen along with the carotid pulsation, it's a V wave. A prominent A wave occurs whenever the atrium is contracting prominently, and that can happen with severe pulmonary hypertension or severe pulmonary stenosis commonly. You use the word cannon wave 
when you get systolic airways. Remember the normal airways are pre-systolic? So when you get systolic airways in complete heart block, the, when the atria contracts against closed AV valves in complete heart block, you get a cannon wave. In complete heart block, the atrial rate is more than the ventricular rate. So some of the uh, atrial contractions will fall on the ventricular, uh, on the closed AV valve. You can get a regular cannon wave if there is a junctional tachycardia and the atrium is captured by the junctional abnormal focus. But in complete heart block, the cannon waves are irregular. In ventricular ectopics also, you can get irregular cannon waves. I would repeat, cannon waves are systolic A waves. They are not just big A waves, they are systolic A waves. Prominent V waves occur when there is tricuspid regurgitation or when there is an ASD with mitral regurgitation or the condition called Gerbode defect, which is an LV2 radiator shunt. In constrictive pericarditis, with inspiration, the JVP rises. Otherwise, normally with inspiration, as the RA is uh, distending, the JVP drops. In small sign, uh, in constrictive pericarditis, with inspiration, there is a rise in the JVP. Then you come to the precordial examination, where there is the shape of the chest. You use those words like pectus excavatum, carinatum, kyphosis, or scoliosis, or um, there would be surgical scars to be noted. After these general points, you come to the important finding of where the apex beat is. The apex beat is the lowermost and outermost point of definite cardiac pulsation. The normal apex beat is localized to one space. It lifts the palpating finger to more than a third of systole more than the level of the adjoining ribs. So the degree of lifting is more than the level of the adjoining ribs, and the duration is less than a third, of, uh, so normally it's less than a third of systole. Uh, if it's more than a third of systole, it's either forceful or heaving, as we would explain shortly. You use the word a tapping apex beat when there's a palpable shock with the first sound over the apex beat. You use the word forceful apex beat when the palpating finger is lifted beyond the adjoining rib for more than a third of systole. Uh, typically seen in mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation. You use the word heaving apex beat where the heave, the lift, is sustained for more than half the duration of systole. Typically the feature of severe aortic stenosis or hypertension. In hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, the, there's a double apex beat because the LVOT obstruction uh, slows down the ejection. So you get two impulses over the apex beat. And when a palpable S4 is added to it, you get a triple apex beat. When you look at the chest, left parasternal pulsations are a feature of RV volume overload. They may extend up to the apex when RV forms the apex. Pulsations in the second space, visible or palpable, denote enlarged pulmonary artery. Left parasternal heave suggests a right ventricular pressure overload. Epigastric pulsations denote RV enlargement. The entire precordium may pulsate in systole with the mitral regurgitation. Pulsations may be seen across the sternum in Epstein's anomaly from the right atrium. Pulsations, systolic pulsations to the right of the sternum is seen in ascending aortic aneurysm as in Marfan syndrome. So now we have discussed examining the child, everything other than auscultation. Auscultation we will deal separately in the next lecture. So the, what we discussed in this lecture is we have taken the history. We have already discussed what is the importance of each symptom that you hear. Then you have started examining the child you have made the conclusion that this child is not terribly sick. We described the features of an acutely ill child. And then having confirmed that your child is not acutely sick, you have gone on to examine in detail, anthropometry, general examination, pulse, BP, JVP, precordium, and apex speech. This is what we have discussed so far. In the next lecture, we will deal with auscultation. Thank you.